Hello, I'm Tom Gosling, Executive Fellow at the European Corporate Governance Institute, and I'm here today with Nadia Malenko, Professor of Finance at Boston College, to discuss her paper, Custom Proxy Voting Advice, which she's co-authored with Edwin Hugh, Associate Professor at the University of Virginia Law School, and Jonathan Zitnick, Associate Professor at Georgetown University Law School. So, Nadia, thanks very much for taking the time to speak to me today. Thank you, Tom, for inviting me. It's my pleasure. So I spent 20 years advising boards on executive compensation and corporate governance. And I can tell you that nothing is more likely to trigger a tirade from a board chair than to mention proxy voting agencies. And they seem to be blamed for all manner of ills that have attracted the interest of regulators on both sides of the Atlantic. I mean, in my view, the criticism has often built been um, uh, ill-informed. So your paper immediately attracted my interest because not only do you put some facts on the table, but you create a theoretical framework for us to think about the role of proxy agencies and how they're used by investors. Um, so to start with, perhaps you could just explain what custom proxy voting advice is, how it differs from the benchmark recommendation that firms make and, and how prevalent is it? Uh, the idea is uh, that for any given proposal, for example, a vote in a director, the proxy advisor does not produce one single recommendation. Instead, it produces many different recommendations for different shareholders, which are tailored to this shareholder's individual voting ideologies. So maybe just to give an example, there'll be a benchmark recommendation, say, against the director. And this is what is observed by the shareholders who do not customize. Uh, that's the recommendation that usually gets cited by the media, that's what has been studied in academic research. Uh, but many shareholders will receive custom recommendations that may differ from this benchmark recommendation. So what happens is prior to the proxy season, a fund will carefully think about its voting ideology and preferences, communicate them to the proxy advisor, and then these views will get reflected in the custom recommendations the fund receives. Some examples of those would be, for example, proxy advisors apply a cutoff of five board seats to classify a director as busy and start recommending against. Mm -hmm. But for some shareholders, this cutoff may be too restrictive and the custom recommendation will reflect it and maybe recommend in favor. Mm -hmm. Or another example for some shareholders, board oversight of environmental and social issues could be quite important. And again, they might want the custom recommendations to reflect it and they recommend against if the board does not provide oversight of this issue. And, and you asked about the, the prevalence of these recommendations. We actually find that customization is quite widespread. Right. So in our sample, 80% of funds are customizers. Mm -hmm. uh, and we moreover find that these custom recommendations differ very often from the benchmark recommendations. Mm -hmm. Our estimates suggest they differ in more than 20% of ballots. I think this is really interesting that how prevalent it is because a lot of prior academic studies have often tended to focus on the benchmark policy as this data is readily available. So could you just describe the data set you use to get access to information on how investors use custom policies? Absolutely. So our data comes from Glass-Lewis. This is uh, the second largest proxy advisor uh, in the market. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we observe for each customer of Glass-Lewis is, first of all, whether the fund customizes or not. If it customizes, we observe the type, the level of customization, low, medium, high, the higher the level, essentially the more customized the policies are and the larger would be the difference with benchmark recommendation. Uh, and then we also observe for each shareholder meeting whether the fund voted differently from the benchmark recommendations on at least one proposal on the ballot. So our analysis is based on glass Lewis's customers. Uh, that said, we do know that customization is quite spread uh, among the customers of ISS, uh, the other large proxy mm -hmm. advisor as well. According to ISS itself, about 90% of the shares that are voted by ISS on behalf of their clients are linked to clients' custom voting. So that 90-90? 9-0, yes. Right, okay, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, this is really the norm, isn't it? This is the way these, these votes actually happen. Um, and in your paper, you set up a two-stage theoretical model for how an investor would consider whether to customize the policy and then whether they would decide whether to follow the recommendations of the policy. Can you just describe the model, um, maybe what it predicts about who will and will not customize and then how that stacks up against your empirical analysis? Yeah. So I think the best way, given these uh, previous uh, status facts I described, the best way to conceptualize how investors use proxy advisors is, is through a two-stage process. First, a fund decides 
to set a custom voting policies, which would reflect its unit ideology and mm -hmm. help determine the recommendation that receives. And then once the actual proposals are announced and the fund observes the recommendations, uh, the fund can decide whether to conduct additional research and decide whether to deviate from this custom recommendation. So that's how we set up this theoretical model. In the first stage, a fund decides whether to pay a cost to customize. Uh, and then at the second stage, the recommendation that the fund receives, whether it's custom or benchmark, uh, determines the default vote if it does not do any additional research. But the fund can, of course, uh, invest its sources in additional research, which produce which would produce additional information that is not uh, covered by the recommendation. So that's the, the model. And uh, what it predicts is uh, three key determinants over the decision to customize. Uh, the first one is ideology. Essentially, if your ideology is very similar to the proxy advisor's benchmark ideology, it doesn't make sense to incur the cost. The yeah. resulting recommendation would be very similar. And we do find uh, strong evidence in favor of this. Uh, we find that funds that disagree with Glass-Lewis in a consistent ideological direction, they are more likely to custom. So for example, if funds support environmental and social issues more than Glass-Lewis does, they are more likely to custom. So ideology is the first factor. The second uh, prediction is an economies of scale argument. The idea is the fund uh, can uh, achieve these economies of scale by ex ante, right, at the beginning of this proxy season, carefully thinking about its voting policies and paying the cost to customize and communicate them to the proxy advisor. Mm -hmm. Ex post, later, it allows the fund to vote in line with its ideology without necessarily paying attention to each single proposal. And again, in line with this economies of scale argument, we see funds that have more securities in their portfolio are more likely to customize. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the final the final prediction uh, in terms of the determinants of customization is uh, the importance of voting to the fund, right? That the more important voting is, the more likely you are customized. Otherwise, you just don't uh, don't uh, care. And uh, empirically, a proxy for the importance of voting we use is the size, the average stake uh, in an average firm. And we find that funds that are larger, that have larger stakes, are parts of larger fund families are more likely to customize. Okay, so that's all all pretty consistent with what's observed. And and now you might think that putting it in the effort to customize a policy will always result in the investor paying less attention to voting because they can rely more heavily on the custom policy. But your model shows that in addition to this, what we might call substitution effect, there is a complementarity effect that results in the investor paying more attention in some cases. Can, can you explain that and also outline the three key predictions that this leads you to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so indeed, if we think about this interaction of customization with independent research, there are these two opposing effects. One, as you said, is substitution. If you customize your uh, vote, your the recommendation will be more aligned with the with the with the ideology, and that reduces the need to pay attention. So the model predicts that this substitution effect will happen for less contentious, less important proposal for which this bench with this custom recommendation reflects the vote uh, quite precisely. But the second effect is the complementarity effect. Uh, the model predicts that for some proposals and the particular proposals that are particularly important, particularly contentious for which this additional research is more valuable, customizers will actually do more research than if they did not customize. Uh, and the idea is, Customization essentially alerts the funds to proposals that require additional attention, and also it frees up the attention budget, right? Because uh, by allowing to uh, for the fund to pay less attention to these less contentious proposals, it frees up the attention it can spend on the more important proposals. So you asked about the predictions. Uh, overall, the predictions are that uh, customization serves the following key purposes for the fund. One is it just allows uh, the fund to express its ideology effectively right. through the vote. But the second is this attention relocation idea that customization allows the fund to relocate attention more effectively, directing mm -hmm. the focus from maybe less contentious, less important proposals to the more important proposals where additional research and attention are particularly valuable. So let's um, return now to the empirical part of your analysis. So you test these predictions. You explained earlier the data set that you were using. Can you now explain how you use the data to, to, to do that testing and how you distinguish between 
manual or more considered voting uh, and automatic voting. Yeah. So, yes, to test this prediction, we need some measure of attention to voting. Mm. And uh, to construct this measure, we use additional uh, information we have from Glass-Lewis beyond the information I described. And that's exactly what you said, the data on the fund's auto-submission policies and the data on when the fund actually voted. So let me, let me give you some background. Uh, the way the proxy advisors uh, voting platform works is uh, that it repopulates the fund's vote uh, with the voting choice based on this recommendation, whether it's benchmark or it's custom recommendation. And in addition, the fund specifies a specific date, the auto submission date, when this pre-populated vote will be auto submitted if the fund does not manually enter the system, pay attention and decide to uh, vote uh, on a, in some other way. And what we observe is both the auto submission date and the actual date when the vote was submitted. So these two pieces of information essentially allow us to classify votes as either being auto-submitted or manually submitted. Mm -hmm. Say, if we see a vote that was submitted on a day that is different from the fund's auto-submission date, we definitely know the fund logged in, paid attention, and manually voted on that different date. Uh, and we interpret this manual voting as a sign of attention to voting, as a sign of active voting. Uh, we actually validate this measure, and it works we think quite well in measuring attention to votes. So maybe just to give one example, if you are a non-customizer, so subscribe to benchmark recommendations, if you auto submit based on this measure, 100%, almost 100% of uh, those votes will be voted according to the benchmark. I see. If you manually submit, about a quarter of those manually submitted votes will deviate from the benchmark. I see. Okay. So this is a, this looks like a pretty robust measure of attention to voting, doesn't it? And so you start off by looking at those investors that have low manual voting rates. Um, how do customizers differ from non-customizers in the extent to which they follow the benchmark? And, and, and how do you interpret this? Yeah. So the non-customizers actually have lower manual rates than customizers. Customizers seem to be paying more attention. They more manually vote more often than non-customizers. Uh, and we think this reflects the selection effect, the selection, the selection into customization. Yeah, the, the idea is funds that care about voting, for mm -hmm. whom voting is important, they are more likely to customize, right? Otherwise, it's just not worth the extra cost. But they are also more likely to pay attention to voting. And that leads to this positive correlation between customization uh, and manual voting in the data. Mm -hmm. And when you look at this relationship between customization and the propensity to, you know, to vote manually, how, how do you unpick all of that? How do you unpick this sort of selection effect um, versus kind of the real effect? Uh, can you explain how you pick your way through all of this? Yeah, so get, to get to the treatment, right, effect of customization to separate the selection effects, we do two, two sets of tests. Uh, one is based on the idea that customization is typically made at the fund family, the, the decision on customization are made at the fund family level. And we have families for which there is variation in customization decisions across funds within the family. Mm -hmm. So for those families, we typically observe the majority of the funds subscribing to benchmark recommendations, but then one or two funds will be customizers. And by using within family variation, comparing funds within a family that customize or not, we can largely reduce the selection effect. For example, it controls for factors such as importance of voting at the family level. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, in the first test, that's exactly what we do. And what we find is that within the family, funds that customize, they vote manually less than non-customizers. And that's exactly consistent with the substitution effect. Yeah. The way we think about it, in this family, the stewardship team performs uh, a lot of analysis and its recommendations de determine how the majority of the funds will vote. Mm. But then if one or two funds within this family have a very different ideology, it may just not be cost effective for the stewardship team to produce a separate set of policies, a separate set of recommendations. It may be more cost effective to customize for those funds individually, and then those funds will follow those customer recommendations and manually vote less than, pay attention less than the stewardship team. So that's the first test. Yeah. And then the second test that also helps us um, reduce the selection effect is uh, based on what we call ready-made customizers. So right. let me tell you a little bit of what we mean by that. 
the vast majority of the funds in our sample that customize, they subscribe to tailored recommendations, recommendations that are tailored to their individual uh, preferences. But there is a small percent, about 1% of funds that we call ready-made uh, custom that are ready-made customizers. They subscribe to already predetermined policies that were constructed by the proxy advisor. Sometimes you see RSS, Glass Lewis call them thematic or specialty policies. They are available on their websites. Mm -hmm. You can have an ESG policy or climate policy, others. So these mm -hmm. are a menu, this is a menu of predetermined policies, and subscribing to those is much cheaper. Okay. So what, what that means is the selection effect will be less pronounced because even funds with less importance of voting will choose to select into those uh, menus if they carefully reflect their ideologies. Mm -hmm. And then for those ready-made customizers, we again compare the manual voting rates and show that they mo vote manually less frequently than non-customizers, again, in line with substitution. Right, okay. So, so I think one of the most interesting findings relates to this concept of complementarity. So while customization can enable investors to spend um, less time on most voting recommendations, it might also lead them to allocating more attention than non-customizers to contentious proposals. What did you find here? Yeah, so the key prediction of, of what you said of this complementarity effect is that the sensitivity of manual voting two contentious proposals should be higher for customizers than for non-customizers. So what we do is try to identify different categories of meetings with important contentious proposals. Uh, these would be meetings with a recommendation of either ISS or Glass-Lewis against management, or a meeting where there is a proxy uh, a contest or a special meeting. And across all these categories of meetings, we do see this uh, complementarity prediction uh, being consistent with the data customizers are more sensitive to important meetings in their attention to voting, in manual voting, compared to non-customizers. And that also holds at the intensive margin. So customizers who have a higher degree of customization are more sensitive compared to customizers with a lower degree of customization. I think a lot of what we've discussed today is just probably unknown by a large number of market participants. I find it really fascinating. And so I'd just like to finish with the question about what implications do you think your findings have for how we should think about the common criticism made about the role of proxy voting agencies? Yeah, so definitely the, the first is actually maybe exactly like you said. In some sense, we offer a more nuanced perspective on the role of proxy advisors that is usually about trade. And in particular, we suggest a move away from an exclusive focus on benchmark recommendations. There is a frequent concern about one single recommendation having a very large influence, but as we emphasize, proxy advisors provide far more than one recommendation on any given proposal. So that's just this basic uh, implication. More on the policy side, uh, policymakers have considered actually banning pre-populated voting choices and auto-submission of the votes, uh, with the idea that it would encourage paying more attention to voting. But what our findings suggest is that there may be costs of limiting other submission. Mm. First, it may discourage the use of customization, but discouraging the use of customization could mean more reliance on benchmark recommendation and worse aggregation of these diverse preferences that customization allows, as our paper shows. So that's one effect. And the second effect is that paradoxically, that tension to voting could actually decrease. That's exactly the essence of the complementarity effect. And then maybe one more thing to, to, to point out is that this is all becoming quite relevant in the context of the move towards pass-through voting. Mm -hmm. If we think about how large asset managers are implementing the pass-through voting, their voting choice programs, very often it involves the use of custom recommendation, either ready-made or sometimes even uh, this tailored custom recommendation. And that suggests probably customization could be becoming more prominent uh, over time. So it's important uh, to understand these custom voting policies and their role. Mm. Well, I think your paper gives a chance for us to avoid some bad regulatory choices. It's certainly been fascinating to discuss it with you. And I'd encourage everybody to read the paper. It's very insightful and accessible. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom.